Oh, Latin one. I'm so tired of just making the same videos in front of the whiteboard all the time. I just, uh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it, but we need to talk about datives and I couldn't think of something more fun to do. Uh, at least not at this hour in the morning. I'm very tired and, and it's the day after the election. I'm very tired. <laughs> um, do you know what? At least, at least I can go out of order. So I'm not going to start at one end and go to the other. I'm going to bounce around uh, while I'm talking about indirect objects or datives, okay? <clears throat> this is actually, of all the cases, the one that I think is the hardest to teach. Um, and it's my least favorite one to teach because I think it's the hardest to teach. And I really think this is just because I don't think English speakers are very good at understanding what direct objects are or what they're for. But that's what we're going to do now, is we're going to start understanding the dire uh, the indirect object. Not the direct object, the indirect object. But, you know, it's talking about the direct relationships within a sentence might actually be a good place to start. Because um, there's a reason why we learn those first, right? I mean, it is November uh, at the time of this posting, and we've been reading Latin now for three months, almost. Just shy, like two and a half months. And we have not formally talked about this case yet. And that's because um, the direct relationships are much easier to understand. So the direct relationships in your sentence are your, your nominative, your verb, your accusative. Right? You've got a nominative subject that governs the verb. That's why verbs have personal endings, and those personal endings have to agree with whatever the subject is. Because the nominative governs the verb. It is the subject that does the thing, whatever is being done. And then um, while it's true that not all verbs take an accusative direct object, because some don't need one, if that is a, an action or an activity that acts upon something else, that other thing that it acts upon is the accusative. So the subject, uh, if, it's, if it's acting upon something else, is doing anything that is the verb, and the thing that it does to is the accusative. All right? there's, like a, there's like a nice little chain there. But then there are other cases, right? We don't, we don't just learn the nominative and the accusative and then connect them with verbs. That's not all we do. We also have genitives that provide us extra context and information by essentially modifying other nouns. For our purposes in Latin 1, it's mostly just shown by showing possession over other nouns. But still, they add extra context by showing that possession or doing whatever else it could be that they do. Um, ablatives provide us extra information by usually giving us something adverbial to know about the sentence, you know, telling us when something happens, where it happens, with whom it happens, by whom it happens, from where it happens. Um, and then there's a dative, uh, an indirect object. And how does it fit into this chain? The thing about the dative is that it is... It is affected by what's going on in the sentence, but it's affected by what's going on in the sentence without being the thing doing the activity or without being the thing acted upon. It's just affected by it. It's just related to whatever is happening. And the way that we show this in English is either by word order or by using the prepositions to or for. That's how we do this in English is, is with those good old words to and for. All right. And you're not going to have these in just any sentence. It's actually not just because, you know, it's a little, like, headier to understand that we put this off. We also put it off because you're not going to see them as often as you see these more direct relationships. Um, specifically, you're going to see it with things like verbs of giving, speaking, showing, um, where essentially the dative is a recipient of something. So in this particular example... Uh, it says, because the statue was falling all the time, notice my imperfect verb there, uh, the, uh, the sculptor gave his letter of resignation to Cornelius. I've actually got quite a bit going on in this sentence, but down here where the dative is, and Cornelio is my dative to Cornelius, I went ahead and underlined the direct relationships in blue, just like I did over here, right? So I've got my direct relationships underlined in blue. I've got my sculptor, who is the subject, and I've got the verb, the thing that he did, he gave. And there's the letter that's the direct object because that's the thing he gave. So he's acting upon the letter by giving it. But then we have a, a recipient of that letter. 
he gave it to Cornelius. All right. By the way, the dative case is by its name sort of the the giving case. As you can see in these principal parts here, do, dare, dedi, datus. This fourth principal part, datus, is in fact where we get the word dative. Because this is actually one of the things that is the most basic job of the dative to express to whom you give something, right? Cornelius is not the person giving, he is not the thing given, but he is the person given to, all right? So um, anytime you have any verb that's in this range of things, you can and likely will have a dative. I have some more examples over here. Trare mihi ilum librum. Uh, hand me that book, all right? In, instead of having a, a, an actual, like, written out subject here, I've just got a, a, an imperative verb. So it's got the implied subject of you, but this imperative verb is taking on a direct object, ilum librum, right? Hand me that book. So you would be the subject. Handing is what I want you to do. The book is what I want you to hand me. Direct relationships. And I want you to hand it to me so that I would be the recipient of the book. And that's why mihi here is in the, the dative form of our first person per, uh, personal pronoun, all right? Um, it's not always gonna be giving and handing though. It could also be showing, speaking, talking to. That's what I have down here, right? Uh, did that man show his ticket to the carriage driver? So we've got did show as our verb, and we have a subject of that verb, illa, that man, or you could also just say he. And then there's a direct object, ticket. Did he show his ticket? And then there's a recipient of that, not because the guy's necessarily taking the ticket, but because he's seeing it. Did he show it to the carriage driver, all right? And for that matter, there actually doesn't have to be a direct object even. Like I said, there are contexts in which you don't need one. Um, so like with speaking uh, and, and like talking and, and even sometimes uh, appearing, which is similar to showing, you can have a dative without a direct object, right? Credasne praeclarus cantor mihi ipsi dixit. Would you believe the famous seek, excuse me, would you believe the famous singer spoke to me? Right? And so I've got my famous singer here. I should have underlined that in blue because it agrees with cantor. But would you believe the famous singer, subject, spoke, and then to me, and I even put an ipsi in here, like to me myself, intensified uh you know don't want to brag too much but uh hang out with some famous singers sometimes um or at least they're, they're famous to me so yeah so those are all instances in which you're going to translate the dative with a two or technically you don't even have to do it with a two you can say hand me that book or you can say hand that book to me but either way, you're showing that me is the indirect object. It's the recipient of the book or recipient of the knowledge or of the words or of the thing shown. All right. But that's not always what the indirect object is going to do. All right. The indirect object could be a recipient of something. It could also show benefit or advantage. Now, this is a spot where I'm deviating a little bit from the way your book presents things. Again, this is you know for those people reading Eke Romani, so any of my students who are most likely to watch this. Um, they don't use the words benefit and advantage when they explain the dative, and I actually think that's a mistake. That's why I do use the words benefit or advantage when I describe the dative. Because where you could be a literal recipient of something, you could also just be the recipient of the good, or it doesn't even have to be literal good, it could actually be bad. The grammatical relationship is the same, but you could be just affected by the thing, right? So what this one says, uh, My brother will make food for you. Now, I know here you might be thinking, but you're still a recipient of sorts, right? Because if, you, if he makes food for you, then, then you're getting the food. And while that's true, my verb here, though, is not like giving or handing over. My verb is to make, and to make doesn't inherently take a direct object in the way, uh, sorry, excuse me, an indirect object in the way that giving would. But nevertheless, to make food for somebody else is to do something for their benefit. And perhaps an even better example might be this one. Ad lanii tabernam felibus yeram. I had gone to the butcher shop for my cats. The cats are not in any way being directly affected by me going to the butcher shop. 
because they're not the subject, I am, as implied by my first person verb. They're not the object because there's actually no direct object here anyway. To go is intransitive. It can't take a direct object. There's a prepositional phrase for where I went, but the main idea is just that I had gone somewhere. But I did it for the benefit of my cats, and that's why felibus is in the dative, because I did this thing for them. All right? Now, if this is still a little hard for you to get your head around, one way you can test a sentence to see if what you think is an indirect object is truly an indirect object and not something else is you can flip your sentence around and make it passive. These are all active sentences. In Latin 1, we only see active sentences. But if you were to flip the sentence around and like turn it backwards and make it passive, um, the relationships of those direct relationships would all change. But the, uh, the indirect ones would, wouldn't. So, you know, for instance, over here where I say the, the sculptor, there we go, the sculptor gave the letter to Cornelius, if you flip that around and make it passive, then what was the direct object becomes the subject, what was the subject becomes an agent, but the indirect object will be the same. If you don't know what I mean by that, here's what it would sound like. Instead of saying the sculptor gave uh, a letter to Cornelius, it would suddenly be a letter was given by the sculptor to Cornelius. The two Cornelius didn't change because he was uh, only ever indirectly related to everything else. And so um, even if you express that idea differently, the indirect object remains an indirect object. A letter was given to Cornelius. Um, you know, or if I say, uh, you know, like this one where it's like, did that man uh, show his ticket to the coachman? Again, if I flip that around and make it passive, it would say, like, you know, was the ticket shown to the coachman? The ticket might turn into the subject, but to the coachman stays the same. So if ever you're not sure, you can flip it around and make it passive. If you do that, then, um, then you'll know for certain because the indirect object shouldn't change, even in this example with the food. You can flip that around and make it passive too and say, food will be made for you. And the for you is the same as it was when the sentence was active, okay? So that is in uh, the real basic sense, in the big broad strokes, what the indirect object is about. There is more to this. There are special verbs that work with datives. I'm not going to get into that now. Um, that's something we can talk about in class. Uh, there are also some more complex things that you don't need to know in Latin 1, so we won't talk about those either. However, if you're in Latin 3 and you're watching this for a quick review, there is a video coming for you on datives really soon as well. In fact, they might even get uploaded on the same day, because if you're in Latin 3, then you do need to know those more complex things about the dative. Anyway, I will talk to everybody later.